All right, students, welcome back to Dante's The Divine Comedy, Lecture 25, Purgatorio, Lecture 8, Statius' Debt to Virgil, His Prodigality, and Examples of Generosity. We begin with quotation. We'll have Virgil here asking Statius who he is. And so, and now, may it please you to tell me who you were, and in your words, may I find why you've lain here for so many centuries. So recall, we are now in Terrace 5 amongst the avaricious and the prodigal, with uh, several penitents who are face down, facing the ground. Statius is the first century Roman poet who we recently met. We felt a mountain quake. He was compared to Jesus, as Luke describes him, after he is reborn after death. And uh, this man explained to us that apparently after sin is totally expurgated from somebody and their will is freed, their will then no longer searches for uh, penitence, no longer wants to be punished and expiated, but seeks to go above. And so the mountain quake happens not randomly, but whenever a soul liberates its will from vice and sin. And that is what has just happened with Statius. And so this character, Virgil, is saying, well, you know, why is it that you just spent so many years, I think it was 500, amongst the uh, apparently avaricious? And so, Statius responds, In that age, when the worthy Titus was helped from the highest king, avenged the wounds from which the blood that Judas sold had flowed. I'll explain that in a moment. I had sufficient fame beyond that spirit reply. I bore the name that lasts the longest and honors most, but faith was not yet mine. So gentle was the spirit of my verse, apparently he's a poet, that Rome drew me, son of Toulouse, to her. And there my brow deserved a crown of myrtle. So he did a good job. On earth my name is still remembered. Statius, I sing of Thebes, and then of great Achilles, I fell along the way of that last labor. All right, so what did he just tell us? So first thing is he said that he lived around the time of 70 CE, which means the first century CE, uh, or common era. That means the century um, after we have that switch from BC or BCE, we go down one, zero, then back up to one. It's the, uh, the first century after uh, uh, Anno Domini, which many people think AD stands for after death of Christ wouldn't make any sense because he's actually born in the year one, so that's not obviously not after his death. In any case, we use the conventions AD and CE. One is secular, one is a little more sacred, and also uh, BCE and BC, before Common Era and before Christ. They uh, mean essentially the same thing. They do indicate the same spans of time. In any case, Statius existed in this first century after the coming of Christ, during the time when Titus, a Roman emperor, persecuted the Jews by destroying their temple. It's a very famous event, very horrific event. Though the medieval Christians, because of uh, the Caiaphas, because of the Jewish influence on the death of Jesus, particularly through the uh, machinations of the high priest Caiaphas, who we saw horizontally um, crucified down in the Inferno, many medieval Christians, including Dante, thought that that was sort of divine retribution for their hand in killing God. And so, uh, that's why Dante mentions that. Now, the next thing that we get from Statius, besides the fact that he was born after Christ, which is significant because, of course, he was saved and is on purgatory and is going to go to heaven, even though he, it seems like he was a pagan, but then experienced a conversion. The second thing he says is he was a poet, and a poet of some merit and some note. In fact, he deserved the myrtle. That means, uh, uh, that's, sort of, that's the opposite of a crown of thorns. That's a crown for those who are victorious. Uh, victorious in some sort of literary do domain. And so he wrote two very famous works, two uh, epics. One he finished that revolves around the war at Thebes, the, where the seven at Thebes come from, like Diomedes' father, Tidius, very famously, and the very famous uh, husband of Eryphile, who was sold out by him, who was one of the future seers that we saw down uh, amongst the future seers in the Mala Bolgia. Uh, and let's see, who else? Who else is very famous there? And also, uh, of course, Capanius, who was fulminated there at Thebes, who we got to see down in the Inferno. In any case, Statius is the man who wrote the account of the war at Thebes, just as Homer was the man who wrote the account of the war at Troy. And those two wars themselves comprise the two generations of the age of heroes. Now, the Achilleid. That would be great if we had it. But we only have one book of the Achilleid. And it's actually the book where Thetis goes to find Chiron the centaur and tells Achilleus, um, you're going to be, uh, uh, these Achaeans are going to try and take you to a war where you're going to die, so I need you to dress as a woman. And they have a big argument. I've read this before. And uh, eventually Achilles, Achilleus, 
agrees to dress up as a woman, and that's essentially where the book ends. That's essentially where the book ends, because unfortunately, Statius, during the course of writing it, died. So he waited a little bit too long in order to write it. Perhaps that's part of why he was slothful. Uh, just kidding, we'll actually find out why that was. In any case, I quote, The sparks that warmed me, the seeds of my ardor, were from the holy fire, the same that gave more than a thousand poets light and flame. I speak of the Aeneid. When I wrote verse, it was mother to me. It was nurse. My work without it would not weigh an ounce. And to have lived on earth when Virgil lived, for that I would extend by one more year the time I owe before my exiles end. And so Statius says something rather enormous in this moment. He says that the Aeneid was mother, was nurse to him, that he drank from the milk of the Aeneid in order to become a strong poet himself, and that without the Aeneid, his work would not have been worth an ounce. And so his major literary influence was Virgil, and he lived uh, uh, not even a hundred years removed from Virgil. Recall that Virgil dies in 19 BCE, Statius lives until at least 70 CE, and so he comes right after the time of Virgil, and he even makes the very dynamic claim that uh, a more than a thousand others received their calling to be poets by reading the poetry of Virgil, which is a major thing for a poet to say. This is the major influence. This is the mother to his art and craft. But that he would even extend his punishment on purgatory an entire year if he could have lived during the time of Virgil, which means if he had the chance to meet Virgil, he would be willing to offer an entire year of punishing labor on the mountain of purgatory. And this causes Dante to crack a big old smile. The big old sort of smile that when you're talking to someone, you're like, why are you smiling like that? That's fishy that you're smiling like that. And in fact, we see it. At this I answered, ancient spirit, you perhaps are wondering at the smile I smiled. But I would have you feel still more surprised. He who is God, this is Dante. And you can imagine how great he feels here. He's like, oh, you really like Virgil, huh? That's cool. I, I really like him too. Oh, you, you could spend a year being punished to meet Virgil? And he takes a quick look at Virgil, smiling. And Virgil actually gives him a look that says, hey man, don't, don't talk about me. It's not about me here. And Dante just can't help it. He's like, <laughs> he's like someone who, who doesn't know how to conceal a trick. Uh, he's the person that if there's a surprise party, you don't tell them about it because they're going to give up the, they're going to tell everybody about it. In any case, he who is God who leads my eyes on high, is that same Virgil from whom you derive the power to sing of men and of the gods. Interesting reference there to sing of men. I suppose that's a, uh, like, say, Achilles, or and of the gods, like the gods of Achilles. But it does also remind me of the difference between the Odyssey and the Iliad, the Odyssey being more a story about humans, the Iliad featuring more uh, events of the gods. In any case, do not suppose my smile had any source beyond the speech you spoke. Be sure it was those words you said of him that were the cause. Now he had bent to kiss my teacher's feet. But Virgil told him, brother, there's no need. You are a shade. A shade is what you see. So just as when we saw the Pope last time. Ah, yeah, small correction from yesterday. I was calling Pope Nicholas III from amongst the Simonists, Pope Innocent. Know that it is Pope Nicholas III that we see upside down amongst the Simonists. I corrected that in the description of the audio for the lecture, but I thought I would say that out loud as well, just in case. Brother, there's no need. You are a shade. A shade is what you see. Virgil began. Love that is kindled by virtue. That's the love in Statius for Virgil because of the virtue or excellence of Virgil. Will in another find a reply as long as that love's flame appears without the rest of so from the time when Juvenal, descending among us in hell's limo, had made plain the fondness that you felt for me, my own benevolence towards you has been much or has been much richer than any ever given to a person one has not seen. Thus now these stairs seem short. I love that quote. That's very interesting. If you read closely, you'll notice that the claim that Virgil is making about his affection for Statius is a claim that Dante could very much make about his affection for Virgil. Virgil met Juvenal, who was himself a Roman poet, who died before Statius died. Juvenal, being pagan, then came down to hell, into limbo, where Virgil was. Juvenal, knowing Statius at the time, then told Virgil of Statius' great abilities and his great love for Virgil, which then made Virgil hold great love for Statius because of 
uh, his great abilities and love for Virgil in the first place. It's like when you hear someone's a big fan of you, you start to have a little more affection for them. In any case, just notice this claim. My own benevolence, that means goodwill, toward you has been much richer than any ever given to a person one has not seen. Well, who's a person that Dante has never seen who he has quite a bit of goodwill for? Virgil, of course. And so that's a very interesting cl claim. If you read closely, you will see things like this, but you don't see them unless you see uh, the cracks in the mosaic. In any case, but tell me, and as friend forgive me if excessive candor lets, or candor, lets my reins relax, and as a friend exchange your words with me. How was it that you found within your breast a place for avarice, greed, when you possessed the wisdom you had nurtured with such care? So Virgil says, okay, yeah, well, so you love me, and I, I, I apparently love you, and we're big fans of each other. How is it that you were so filled with greed then? if you really understood the wisdom of all that that I said. Indeed, because true causes are concealed, we often face deceptive reasoning and things provoke perplexity in us. Your question makes me sure that you're convinced, perhaps because my circle was the fifth, that in the life I once lived, avarice had been my sin. Know then that I was far from avarice. It was my lack of measure. Thousands of months have punished. And if I had not corrected my assessment by my understanding what your verses meant when you, as if enraged by human nature, and then he goes on, I actually skipped the lines, to, uh, because Stacia's actually here, uh, misquotes Virgil, and scholars tend to think that this is a conscious change by Dante of what Virgil said in order to change uh, the meaning of what Virgil said in order to put that in line with Dante's thought, but we're not going to think about that that much. In any case, we skip a few lines. How many are to rise again with heads cropped close, this is Stacia's, whom ignorance prevents from reaching repentance in and at the end of life. Those are the avaricious, tonsured monks that we saw down in the inferno. And now that when a sin is countered by another fault directly opposite, that would be prodigality to avarice, to it, then here both sins see their green wither. Thus I join those who pay for avarice in my purgation through what brought me here, though what brought me here, excuse me, was prodigality its opposite. So he says I wasn't avaricious. I was prodigal. And what the problem was is not that I overloved or underloved money, it's that I didn't have the proper measure. I didn't have a balanced perspective on money. And so when you're off balance, one way or the other, you tend to create a feedback loop that leads you to become less and less balanced rather than, of course, more and more balanced, which takes tremendous effort of the will and skill. And so now Statius will actually actively declare that Virgil made him a poet. But even more importantly, that Virgil made him a Christian. And so it was Virgil that led him down the path to poetry, then down the path towards virtue and excellence, and then even through one of his works, not the Aeneid in this case, but rather his Eclogue, which was an earlier work of his. The Eclogues and the Georgics were works he wrote in preparation for the Aeneid, looking uh, backwards at least. Well, let's see why it was that Statius is not down in circle four of the Inferno, but is rather on terrace five of the Purgatorio. And he to him, you were the first to send me to drink within Parnassus's caves, and you the first who after God enlightened me. You did, as he who goes by night and carries the lamp behind him, he is of no help to his own self, but teaches those who follow. When you declared, the ages are renewed, Justice and man's first time on earth return from heaven a new progeny descends. Just an interesting note about that is that we are literally moving towards the first place man existed according to Dante and the New slash Old Testament. We are heading towards Eden. And so as we head to the top, we're heading uh, not forward in time, but backwards in time. Back towards the first place humans ever were. Interesting that what the act of uh, going up the mountain of purgatory is, is what is mentioned by Statius quoting Virgil here. The ages are renewed, just as one's soul is renewed, and without sin and uh, vice by this mountain of purgatory. Justice and man's first time on earth return. Man's time as a pure being, a pure being unalloyed by sin and vice. That is what Statius has literally just done for himself by his own purgation. And from heaven a new progeny descends, well, that's so funny, because we just ran into a new man who is described as somebody who is from heaven, Jesus. Statius. Very interesting what's happening here. 
with uh, and very interesting the connection between purgation of sin slash virtue and the uh, uh, learning of stories and the effort of understanding stories. Is of course just hearing a story is not the same as understanding it, and the effect is very different. In any case, through you, I was a poet, and through you, a Christian. But that you may see more plainly, I'll set my hand to color what I sketch. Disseminated by the messengers of the eternal kingdom, the true faith by then had penetrated all the world, and the new preachers preached in such accord with what you'd said, and I have just repeated that I was drawn into frequenting them. That's interesting there. Notice that uh, language of planting of seeds, those gardening metaphors there. Disseminated, putting seeds in. Um, that is, uh, putting seeds into the ground. And penetrated the earth, as in they took uh, their, there's a tool called a hoe, to move uh, dirt, and then you put seeds inside of the, uh, where that dirt was, and usually make uh, rows and columns of that, and uh, then plants grow from that. And so his idea is that these seeds had just been planted, and that he was one of the first people to take from the fruits of these seeds. And then again, so again, more gardening metaphors, more coming to uh, fruition metaphors, you might say. So, Virgil. What did he do for Stations? Well, about as much as you can possibly do for somebody that you've never met. He made him a poet through his work in the Aeneid. He made him a Christian through his work in Eclogue 4, which I will be reading to you some today, as you can tell. Today is a close reading day. And Virgil held the lamp behind him. He apparently held a lamp behind him that uh, lit up the path for thousands of others, for more than a thousand others, as well as Statius, but it did him no good. The idea here seems to be something like this. Virgil, through his work, prophesied the coming of a Christian age and Christ so that those who would read him after the coming of Christ, like Statius, could then be led to the belief that the pagan poets were seeing in the future the coming of the Christian age and that they were, in fact, part of the coming of the Christian age in a, a sort of a... a, a how do I say this? What is the word for this? In a providential way. As in, they are part of a process that led to the culmination of the process, but they were not yet there yet. So, Virgil, with the coming of Christ, takes his place as one of the writers who were predecessors to Christ, and thus makes it possible, if one studies the history of literature according to Statius, not only to see the coming of Christ, but to see the foretelling and the forecoming of Christ beforehand. And so Virgil becomes... A uh, sort of an arrow or a pointer or a, a, a marker showing that uh, one should be Christian. That is Statius' claim. And just a, a quick note about this. The historical Statius, there is no evidence that he turned Christian. Um, so this is certainly a literary invention of Dante, but it makes perfect sense. Because think about this. Dante has three guides through three canticles. The first guide is a Roman guide who is pagan, who is not Christian, who has limited knowledge of Christian things. The second guide is a Roman who converted from paganism to Christianity and therefore will have slightly more knowledge than Virgil, especially about e what he calls eternal things, but we'll say are medieval Catholic things. And then, of course, we will have an angel for our final guide who will have been a Christian her entire life. And so we see that this is a story about transitions and transformations between one religion and another, and between one perception and another, even. Uh, and between one guide and another, as well. And so, here is that eclogue for which Statius saw, according to Dante, and converted him to Christianity. You should imagine that there had been a boy who was called a god, who existed and lived and was crucified and died before Statius' time, and then he connected that event with this. Muses of Sicily, sing we a somewhat ampler strain, not all men's delight, as in coppices and lowly tamarisks. If we sing of the woods, let them be woods worthy of a consul. Now is come the last age of the Cumaean prophecy. A great cycle of periods is born anew. Now returns the maid, returns the reign of Saturn, that means the golden age. Now from high heaven a new generation comes down. Yet do thou at the, that boy's birth in whom the iron race shall begin to cease and the golden to arise over all the world. Holy Lucina, be gracious. Now thine own Apollo reigns. So, interesting. What do we see there in Epilogue 4? Coming of a new age. How does Statius interpret this according to Dante? Coming of the 
Christian age. The world is renewed. Well, the, the world is, and we just talked about time today, literally renewed in that we go from one to zero to one again. Uh, we actually renew time. And so you can see that convention and sort of a spiritual belief even in our, uh, our chronological ordering of history, which perhaps you didn't know. Perhaps you talked about that in history. In any key case, a new people or race will be born. Well, those are the Christians, and the first of that race will be a new golden child. And that golden child, of course, as interpreted by Statius, according to Dante, would have been uh, Jesus. Now, in reality, Virgil was probably talking about the coming of the new monarchical age of Augustus Caesar, who had just become the, um, the uh, essentially the emperor of the Romans after they were a republic. And recall that the, the republic fell when Julius Caesar declared himself imperator for life. He was then killed by senators led by Cassius and Brutus. Mark Antony then fought a battle at Actium. Uh, against, uh, there was another triumvir, but he, he, he doesn't really matter, and he ends up actually dying, uh, Crassus. But uh, then Mark Antony fought for power from Egypt against uh, Julius Caesar's adopted son, Octavian Caesar. Octavian won, he became Augustus Caesar, and he became effectively emperor of Rome, though he never officially declared himself that. He was a very intelligent politician. In any case, he had a very famous adopted son himself named Marcellus, Marcellus, who's actually directly mentioned by name in Book 6 of the Aeneid. Uh, Marcellus, who, when he was mentioned in the Aeneid, while it was being read by Virgil in front of Octavia, the sister of Octavian, who actually had that son, um, and who had seen him die after raising him, who actually fainted when she heard those lines by Virgil. And so I don't know that he's actually mentioning Marcellus here, but since the eclogues were written before the Aeneid, and Marcellus is included as dead, in the Aeneid, I would imagine that it is very possible that the new boy who is going to lead this new uh, uh, empire of Rome could very well have been Marcellus. It's very interesting how perspectives can change so quickly depending on what you know from history. In any case, uh, Apollo is there mentioned as well. He is, a, of course, a god of light, also a god of prophecy. And uh, there are many connections made between both Apollo and Jesus as a bringer of light, and also Apollo and Dionysus as a god who dies and is reborn. Like two aspects of one. In any case, let's conclude today by seeing a couple um, examples of generosity slash poverty. The first one is the one we would expect. It is an example, again, of an expiating virtue. And whenever we have an expiating virtue, the first example is always of Mary, the Virgin Mary, the mother of Jesus. And this is a very humble situation. A uh, situation in which she shows her poverty and uh, experiences sort of a lack of generosity uh, as described in Luke 2.7. This is very much a Christian and Christmas themed uh, 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 virtue here. Because what happens and what is described is uh, the spirits proclaim. So weeping and praying, the shades themselves call out the examples of avarice and its opposing virtue of generosity or poverty. And here we have Mary... Her poverty is evident. She is extremely modest in her circumstances. And what we see is she is very pregnant. It is almost Christmas Day, though Christmas is, of course, very different for her because she's burying Christ. So she's not celebrating his birth yet. She's going to have him. And so her, Chris, her first Christmas is very different from probably uh, any of ours. In any case, the quote is this. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the end. The first... Example is of just how poor and just how little Mary had when she would bear her child, who was, who was a God-man named Jesus, in the, most, uh, uh, in the most humble possible circumstances. Not even allowed a room in an inn where humans are, near animals who are on hay, uh, without uh, the trappings of a hospital, a midwife, or any of the things that you would expect a normal person to receive at their, uh, at their, uh, at their birth. And so... This is a very Christmas-themed example because, of course, this is the first Christmas. And this is also an example of extreme poverty and how little somebody needs in order to say, uh, make, um, hmm, make a difference in the world. I suppose I'll put it in that way. In any case, I want to move on to the second Christmas-themed here example of generosity. St. Nicholas. And uh, technically, this is the third. We're skipping the Fabricius one. And I thought about whether I even wanted to give these at all. But I wanted you to know that St. Nicholas, 
This is a man whose generosity enabled young women to maintain honor, and is the third individual praised on the Terrace of Avers. Now, so what is it that he did? Well, who is he, I guess, is what I start with. St. Nicholas was venerated by both the Greek and Roman churches, and was a 4th century bishop of Myra in Asia Minor. His remains were later in the 11th century brought to Italy, Barry, and he is also known as Nicholas of Barry because of where his remains are. And yet you say, but why should I know about him? What generous thing did he do? Well, the first thing you should know is that St. Nicholas is the same Nicholas that is described as Santa Claus, uh, especially in that song that says, Old Saint Nick, Old Saint Nick is Santa. And so how did uh, this saint become conflated with this idea of a man who <laughs> with nine reindeer goes around the world every day, or every day, excuse me, on Christmas Eve, and then gives all toys down chimneys to young girls and boys. Well, this is what happened. He acted on a promise insisting that, learn, or excuse me, he learned that a neighbor from, who was an impoverished nobleman was intending to keep the family afloat by prostituting his three daughters because he couldn't pay to keep them anymore. People are expensive to feed, and there were only limited jobs for women throughout all of time until really the 20th century, and that was one of them. So Nicholas, horrified by this proposition, stealthily threw a bundle of gold into the man's house during the night. So he gave them a present at night without showing himself for who he was. Thanking God, because they don't know where the gold came from, uh, the neighbor used the gold to marry his oldest daughter. Nicholas then repeated this procedure two more times, thus providing a dowry for three daughters. And so there you can see the conceit from uh, both the Tooth Fairy and from Christmas, that some invisible force leaves gifts for you at night, which is, of course, a metaphor for the fact that you are safe every night in a Western democracy like this. That is the invisible gift that you are always getting, that people are not constantly stealing from. And yet, this is a physical embodiment of this. He was also the patron saint of sailors, virgins, merchants, and thieves of all things, so I guess he shares some qualities with Hermes. He does get into one's house but rather than taking something, he leaves something. So you may have noticed that creepy element of Santa. He does also see you when you're sleeping. But I thought that I would just show you that we do have uh, an example of the man who is the basis for Santa on this terrace that is very much Christmas-themed right as we begin this Christmas season. Uh, and so I suppose uh, the takeaway from the end of this is be generous. Be generous this year. And uh, perhaps that will help you exculpate avariciousness, and prodigality, um, just to give an anagogical reading of this.